ready to go, ready to go. Okay, here you go, Dan. Best behavior, Dan. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's virtual media briefing about COVID-19 in London and Middlesex County with London Mayor Ed Holder and the Medical Officer of Health and CEO of the Middlesex London Health Unit, Dr. Chris Mackey. We welcome the members of the media who are joining us today. And just a reminder to uh, submit your questions in the question and answer uh, platform here on Microsoft Teams. And also welcome to those tuning in this afternoon on Rogers Television, as well as the Rogers Facebook page and YouTube channel. Those tuning in on Global News Radio, AM 980 CFPL, and those who are watching on the CTV London website. Let's get right to the opening statements and we'll start with Mayor Ed Holder. Mayor Holder. Well, thanks, Dan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. A few things I wanted to touch on this afternoon. Uh, first, today marks the uh, first day back to work for thousands of Londoners as Ontario officially begins phase one of reopening the economy. As uh, we announced last week, starting today, among a number of other services, all retail stores with a street entrance can now open with limited capacity. And over the weekend, uh, as uh, we're aware, golf courses, boating clubs, marinas reopened, and today all off-leash off uh, dog parks in the City of London have reopened. So that's all very, very good news. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, over the long weekend, uh, City bylaw officers issued more than uh, 200 warnings to various individuals, no fines. Uh, most of the warnings were in relation to people sitting on benches in city parks. I'm also uh, pleased to report we had only two calls related to fireworks with no injuries. We also heard today that the pre uh, from the Premier that while schools remain cancelled for the month of June, summer day camps will be allowed in July and August. At this point, we have no information about how um, that will impact uh, City of London summer camps, but it's something that we're certainly discussing over the next uh, number of days. Also, I want to talk briefly about uh, the United Way of Elgin Middlesex. Uh, this is important that it was announced that local funding applications are now being accepted for the Emergency Community Support Fund. And this uh, fund uh, provides financial support to charities and other qualified recipients adapting their frontline services to support our most vulnerable during the COVID-19 pandemic. The fund was announced by the Government of Canada in collaboration with the United Way Community Foundations of Canada and the Canadian Red Cross. So in our region, the United Way of Elgin Middlesex has approximately $1.3 million to work with. That's significant. And mentioned uh, as well is that funding applications are being accepted uh, from local frontline social service agencies. Those applications can be made up to June 12th and, and with funds dispersed by July 31 and just invite any uh, appropriate organizations to visit the United Way of Elgin Middle, Middlesex London website for more information. So all in all, a great uh, long weekend, uh, saving except the weather a little bit, and uh, let's turn it over doc to Dr. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Unfortunately, when we take a look at the numbers provincially and locally, uh, it's not reassuring at this point. We had our first case, our first day today of over 400 cases reported. Uh, we had dipped below 300 uh, about a week and a half ago, and that has actually trended up provincially to 427 cases announced today. Uh, locally, we had 11 new cases announced today. Uh, some of those would have been catching up from the last week or so, but even if you take the last four days over the weekend and average them, we're still at about five cases uh, per day here, which is not where we want it to be. Uh, the timing obviously isn't great and hopefully some of this is because of those delayed reporting issues in the data uh, because if, if numbers continue to rise as we open up uh, businesses and new facilities uh, that will add up in a bad way. We do have some reassuring numbers from the more serious outcomes. Uh, provincially we've seen a significant drop in deaths. Uh, only 15 new deaths were reported today at the provincial level. At the peak, we were over 80, and over the weekend, it was in the 20s. So that's continued to trend down, very reassuring. Uh, the cases in the ICU has also trended down. That's consistently over the last month or so. Uh, hospital cases, hospitalized cases are up and down a bit. We're at about 1,000 people in the hospital with coronavirus across the province, roughly where that number has been. 
after the last two weeks, maybe a slight downtrend there. But the, uh, the increase in cases and the 427 reported across the province today is quite concerning. Uh, as we do open up our economy, it is now as important as ever that people take measures to protect themselves and to protect their family. Uh, here at the Middlesex London Health Unit, we're going to be looking very closely over the next 24 hours as to what additional measures might be appropriate here in the context of uh, businesses and society opening up. Uh, that's it for me today, Dan. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We do have some questions coming in, so we'll get to those right away. And the first one, Dr. Mackey, is for you. It comes from Dan Brown at the London Free Press. Dr. Mackey, we've talked about seasonality in past briefings with regard to the warm weather and how COVID-19 might respond. Looking back, did COVID-19 act like a seasonal coronavirus when it first arrived here a couple of months ago, or was it more of a one-time event and not necessarily seasonal? Yeah, great question. When you see new viruses emerge, where your population doesn't have any Im immunity, uh, even if they are a seasonal virus, you can often see peaks that are out of season. Uh, and so as an example, in the H1N1 pandemic, the uh, swine flu pandemic in 2009, uh, here in North America, we saw the first peak happen in May, which is quite unusual for influenza. Usually it's February. And then we saw a second peak happen in October, November of that year. Again, quite early. Uh, but still following a seasonal pattern. The timing of the epidemic wave with this current coronavirus would match pretty closely what other coronaviruses uh, do in Canada on an average year. Uh, but of course, you know, the, the driver of the cases here is that this is a new pandemic virus that no one has immunity to. So that's why you saw a peak that would be higher than you would with uh, normal coronaviruses. So uh, there's nothing yet that suggests that, uh, at least here, this coronavirus is anything other than seasonal. Uh, you do also, though, if you look around the world, we saw uh, peaks of the pandemic wave in most countries within a couple of months of each other. And that includes countries in the Southern Hemisphere. And so, uh, you know, usually Southern Hemisphere countries peaks are off uh, our peaks by about six months. Their summer is our winter and vice versa. Uh, so the fact that you saw those peaks happening around the world, again, it's just another sign that this is a, a pandemic virus with the ability to cause a uh, pandemic wave outside of its normal season. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Dr. Mackey, we have another question for you. This one is from Sophia Rodriguez from CBC London. Uh, Dr. Mackey, people in other southwestern Ontario cities have had to return for a second and even a third COVID-19 test because the lab could not process the first test in time. Has this happened to people in our region? And if so, how many? So uh, great question. And, and I think it was actually uh, the mayor that asked this question this morning on the city's EOC discussions. Uh, the issue of turnaround time in the lab has been one that we watched closely. Uh, as, as you know, if the lab tests the sample once it's swabbed, if it sits on a shelf for more than three days, it either needs to be frozen to preserve it or discard it uh, because they do expire. And so you have seen in, in a number of other places, uh, those, uh, you know, especially with the long-term care home swabbing and the huge numbers that have come in there, you've seen some of those swabs, unfortunately, expire on the shelf. Uh, we've been very fortunate that our lab system has worked closely with public health here in the London Middlesex region so that uh, anyone that gets has symptoms and is being tested because they have symptoms, whether uh, it's in the community or in the hospitals, those go to the London Health Sciences Centre Palm Lab. Uh, the Palm Lab has a very good turnaround time and we haven't seen any issues of expiring there. Uh, for all other samples, the, you know, this, the samples that were taken in large numbers from all long-term care home folks, whether they were symptomatic or not, uh, those samples are going through the Public Health Ontario lab system and uh, the, that Public Health Ontario lab system has a, a different process for ensuring uh, the continuity and, and um, appropriate uh, swabbing time, including refrigeration and, and freezing uh, facilities. 
So fortunately, it, in the Middlesex and London area, we haven't seen large numbers of those expires of those tests expiring on shelves. Uh, what we have seen occasionally, and this does happen, we know, is that the samples will spill inside the bags uh, that are sealed, sealed bags that transport the samples. And so occasionally you will have a sample that can't be tested because it has spilled in the bag and obviously presents a safety risk for the folks in the lab. Uh, but those are relatively unusual. All right, thank you, Dr. Mackey, for that response. And, and also for shedding some light a little bit on the, uh, the testing process and how those tests get from the individual and to the lab. All right, uh, the next question is a follow-up from Dan Brown. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mack, we had double-digit increases in cases in the last 24 hours. Is that something that should cause alarm? Well, we should not be seeing uh, these sorts of numbers at this stage, both provincially and locally today. Uh, the numbers are higher than they should be. So uh, really, we're looking at trending. If this continues on for the next few days, we might have to reconsider some of the loosening of public health measures. Uh, but at, at the moment, uh, I don't think we take alarm from one day's worth of data, um, but it is something, again, we're watching very closely. And Dr. Mackey, the next question is actually related to the, the previous two questions. It sort of draws from both of them, and it's from Sofia Rodriguez at CBC. Uh, most of the cases reported today seem to be in the community. What do you think we owe this increase to? Could this be a backlog in testing? Well, one thing that we've seen fairly consistently coming out of the weekends is that the first uh, workday back after the weekend, we see a significant number of tests being reported from the lab system to us. And what we believe is happening is that the tests are being processed as quickly as possible uh, in order to avoid, you know, the samples expiring on a shelf. And then when those tests are, the results are available, they get batched so that they don't all necessarily get sent at the same time, uh, which means that after a weekend, as the labs have had a bit of time to catch up and do some uh, processing, processing of tests and also uh, phoning of health units, you see, uh, you see a, a wave of, of uh, results come in. Uh, we're, again, hoping this is more of a data issue than anything. Um, but we'll be watching it closely. All right, and a follow-up question. You mentioned a little earlier in today's briefing, the health unit will be looking at additional safety measures if cases increase as businesses reopen. What could some of those extra measures be? Yeah, one of the key measures is looking at uh, the processes and procedures and policies inside of uh, the businesses that are opening up. We've put together a generic principles document, which uh, for, you know, for will be useful for any business or, or, or service that is opening up. Uh, and that's available at healthunit.com in our COVID section of our website. Uh, but there are other things, I mean, we've talked a few times about masks. Um, masks, again, as we look at the data, there are, there are uh, some potential benefits to wearing masks and some potential risks as well, if they're not worn properly. Um, you, you know, anecdotally, you do see people uh, who are wearing masks in grocery stores, for example, that sometimes are not as careful about keeping their distance, even though wearing a mask doesn't mean you, you can uh, you can stop keeping your distance. So those are the sorts of things we're looking at. And, uh, you know, if the trend continues in an upward direction, uh, we'll have to look uh, very seriously at those. All right, we have one more question in the queue, gentlemen. And it comes from Sawyer Bogdan at Global News Radio, AM 980 CFPL. Dr. Mackey, this one is for you. Given the rise in numbers, do you think it's too soon for businesses to reopen? Well, I mean, that's the question that uh, is on everybody's mind at this point. And uh, it's not clear to me that we have enough data to say it's too early to open businesses. Uh, certainly, we've had some very positive trending in cases and deaths. ICU and hospitalization, all four of those indicators uh, going down significantly over the last few weeks. Uh, but if we continue to see upticks, then uh, then some of those things may need to be reevaluated. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mackey. Mr. Mayor, thank you as well. Uh, we have no more questions, so we'll uh, finish it a little early today and we will see you tomorrow. And a reminder that tomorrow we will be joined by the warden of Middlesex County, Kathy Burkhart-Jessen,
in addition to Mayor Holder and Dr. Mackey. Have a great rest of your afternoon and we'll see you again tomorrow.